My name is Rhonda Asart, and I am here with Justin McCarthy, who is a former IBM employee, and we are working together on the Boca Raton IBM Oral History Project. Today's date is January 16th, 2013. Mr. McCarthy, I want to thank you first for your time. And what I'd like to ask first is, where are you originally from, and when did you arrive in Boca Raton? I was uh, originally born and raised in Cortland, New York, and I began my IBM career in Endicott, New York, on June 4th, 1956. Okay. And what is your educational background? I have a two-year technical degree from uh, the New York State uh, SUNY uh, New York at Morrisville. Okay. Okay. And you started in Endicott with IBM. When did they approach you or what were the circumstances for you coming to Boca Raton? I worked on a System 360 Model 30 that was developed and manufactured in Endicott. And at the end of that program, I transferred uh, onto a System 370 Mod 145. And before I really got too far into it, maybe six months or more, a very close friend of mine who I had worked with on many other products prior to uh, the 360. His name was William R. Murray, Bill by specifics. And uh, he had started a new program uh, called the System 3 Model 6 that was a model involved with the System 3 that the major portion was being developed in Rochester, Minnesota. And he started a small group and enticed me to come to work for him and work on I.O. devices for the new System 3 Model 6. Um, After about a year and a year and a half, the System 3 Model 6 was transferred to Boca Raton. And in that process, my friend Bill... Uh, wanted me to come to Boca Raton, uh, of which I was not interested in coming to Boca Raton. I thought I would start looking for a job back in the 370. Oh, that's mine. Can you shut that? So you were not interested in transferring to Boca. Why is Uh, that? Well, the reason I was not interested in transferring, I was born and raised in Cortland, which is about 50 miles north of Endicott. And so I had no desire to leave my family and friends and come to Boca Raton where it was too hot for me. Um, But um, subsequently, uh, Bill Murray... Uh, asked me to come to Boca to represent him at a uh, business meeting that was being set up here. And so um, at the same time, he offered me to bring my wife down on this business trip. And I knew what he was up to, so I said, no, I'll pay for my wife's own transportation. So uh, we did come down, we looked around, and uh, it was hot. And uh, I just confirmed that I really didn't care about being here. But while I was here, I had to make a, every evening I had to make a call back to Bill Murray to tell him how the meetings were going. And in about the second evening I called back, he informed me that my very, very best friend, John Gandor, had just accepted a transfer with him to Boca Raton. And that kind of gave me a hiccup, so I didn't know what to do, so I told him I would think more seriously about it. So, um, long story short, because my best friend and his family were coming here, um, and my family and his family were friends, 
Uh, I ended up deciding to come to Boca Raton, even though I was not that excited at the time. Okay, I can understand about the weather. Um, and um, can you talk about that transition that you made from um, the Northeast to Boca? What was it like? Well, I'll tell you, the first time we came down here, my on the business trip, it was in July, my wife and I got off the plane in Miami. The only place you could fly into here was Miami. You couldn't fly into West Palm Beach or anything else from New York. So we came down from uh, New York into Miami, and the two of us will never forget coming out underneath on arrival in the middle of July into the heat of the, where the the end, you know, where you exit from uh, arrivals and hitting that heat and walked out. And we looked at each other and said, "Yeah, we don't really care about being here." <laughs> but uh, anyway, the transition. Uh, at that time, we had four children. Our oldest was probably uh, 10, and the youngest was four. And um, we left in a snowstorm. We left November 13th, 1968, in the middle of a snowstorm. And uh, in fact, it was so bad that my mother, who lived in Cortland, New York, couldn't even come down to see us off at the airport. And it was amazing that the plane actually took off from the Binghamton Airport uh, with the snowstorm that was in progress at the time. So we came down remembering that. And uh, the other thing I'll remember is that it was the first Christmas that we spent away from home where there wasn't snow. And uh, that was kind of interesting. But uh, the, the good news was that a, a number of people that from the same system, uh, it was probably 15 to 18 people, all came down at the same time. And we were pretty close, because there wasn't much here in Boca. We lived over at the Lakeview Apartments on A1A, which IBM had rented and put people in at the time we came down. Uh, and, and most of us, we're having houses built mm -hmm. here in Boca, brand new houses. So that was kind of an exciting part for the family. Um, just remembering back then, uh, the account the accommodations, as I said, were Lakeview Apartments and Ocean View Apartments. We were in Lakeview, which are over on A1A. They're still there. Uh, the neighborhoods that we were looking at for a building. Houses were, at that time, Boca Square, which is still around. Camino Gardens were the more wealthy higher-ups were looking at. And then people halfway in between uh, were looking in North Boca on the canals. But my wife didn't want to live on the canal. She'd afraid one of our kids would fall in there and drown. So uh, we bought where people think is... Uh, uh, Boca Square, but we are actually on the edge of Boca Square in uh, uh, Palmetto Park Terrace. And uh, the the builders, the main builders for IBMers uh, at the time, uh, ours was Snow, I'm trying to remember the, the other builder, but Snow was kind of, the, uh, George Snow was kind of the backup guy. He was just getting into business. He was um, originally a teacher here in Boca Raton and started the construction business. And we were one of his first um, clients. Uh, long story about George Snow, he ended up being killed over in an island, which is another whole long story I won't go into. But we have a snow home and we have lived in that snow home for 44 years. And 251 Southwest 9th Avenue, which we uh, had the house built and moved into it in February of 1969. And we've been there ever since. Okay. So IBM, at the time, 
the Boca Raton location, how big would you say it was when you came? Probably, uh, I'm going to guess somewhere between, uh, say, 200 and 250 people. And there were primarily, maybe not that many, but not more than that. But um, it, the um, facilities that were here it was a building called uh, 203. And it was, um, it was on Banyan Trail, which is just off a military trail, still there today. And Building 203 is still there. But that was primarily a manufacturing facility. And what IBM did was put together a whole bunch of, uh, probably, I'm going to say 20 or 30, maybe more, trailers. They butted them all together and made like a, a building where you'd walk from one trailer to another. And they called that building 210. And that was right at the very end of Banyan Trail just north of Building 203. And that's where the engineering, all the engineering uh, persons went. And at the time, there were really basically two contingents of IBM people that came. Primarily, we came, there were a group that came from Endicott, New York. And then there was a group that came from California. Uh, the, they came, the people from California came from San Jose and they came as a group and they worked on a system that was in development called the System 7 that ended up being completed here and manufactured in Boca Raton. At the same time, our group that came from Endicott, New York, on the System 3 Model 6, uh, we brought the development of that machine down here and we finished that and the two were manufactured and announced at the same time and it was called uh, uh, IBM called it the System 7, 76 because of the System 7 and the Model 6 mm -hmm. um, and that's the way they marketed the, the announcement uh, and that kind of came about um, those announcements were probably 1971 or 2 somewhere in there and these systems that you're talking about they were large mainframes is that correct? no they were not okay what were they? The System 3 Model 6 was a single operator system. And again, it was one of the sub-models of the System 3. That The primary System 3 was developed in Rochester, and we were just one of the models. And we were the smallest model. It was a single operator, had a keyboard display, had um, removable disk files, on the left side where the operator sat and then the processing unit uh, sat on the right. We had a printer, uh, a matrix printer, the 13 inch matrix printer for the base system and then there was also a 22 inch ledger card device that went on it of which you actually took eight and a half by 11 ledger cards and you would feed them into this printer and to keep track of uh, client uh, operations. Um, just a little interesting point. Uh, one place it was used that I recall was a the trucking industry kept track of where their trucks were and their clients, each client of a trucking firm would have a 8.5 by 11 ledger card and every time they would do something for that client they would enter it and they would feed it into a new point and type the new information in. And that um, industry had a big uh, convention about 1971, I could get to you the exact date, but at the Boca Raton Hotel and Club. And we were invited to bring the unit over and demonstrate it to all of the 
uh, people that came from all over the United States, well, all over the world, I guess, to who were in the trucking business to see this device, of which they we sold uh, a number of them. That was one of our best customers. But anyway, a quick story. At the end of the two-day demonstration, we were cleaning up the equipment, and all of the people that were at the convention were invited into the main hall at the... Boca Raton Hotel and Club and we were when we finished we went over and looked in the big doors and in there were a huge number of tables people sitting there having dinner and they had a big stage and we said gee why don't we go in there nobody was standing around so we walked in and found a table where there was a couple of there were three of us that went in and had a couple of open chairs we just sat down we didn't say anything to anybody and Next thing you know, we're eating steak and lobster, and just with everybody else, it was a great time. Next thing you know, there was entertainment up on the stage, singing and dancing and all that stuff. So we sat through the whole evening. We had a great time. And as the evening ended, uh, they came around and asked, uh, in what room are you staying in? And we uh, looked at each other and said, um, 1401. That happened to be a system number that I had worked on in Endicott, and the other guys picked a number 1405 or 1406, and they wrote it down and went away, and we tiptoed out the door and went home. <laughs> Turned out somebody got charged for our dinner. I'm sure it was IBM, but anyway, that was uh, the size of the System 3 Mod 6. The System 7 that came from San Jose, was an interesting system which I had the opportunity later on after the four, after I completed the assignment uh, on the um, System 3 Model 6 to put RPQs on the System 7. And RPQs uh, stands for Request for Price Quotation and that comes in from customers who want something special put on a product and then you you estimate how much this special thing they want would be, give them their estimate, and then they tell you whether to proceed or not. Well, it turns out that the System 7 was a very, very unique system. It didn't fit any other major computer. It was built to be unique. Uh, for example, in Tokyo, the uh, subway systems ran on System 7s. In uh, North Carolina, all of the uh, manufacturing of carpets and blankets and uh, millinery all were run off of uh, System 7. So it was a unique machine. And one of the things that my group did when we did an RPQ was a thing called Cama C. And that was for the AT&T, um, I'm sorry, for the, not the, for the Bell system to keep track of telephone calls when you it would monitor when you picked up a phone and keep track of how long you were on and when you hung it up and then it would bill you but it the system 7 kept track of the telephone calls and we put these all over the United States uh, but the system so the system 7 was uh, kind of unique um, it uh, I forgot what you called it. It wasn't it wasn't called it basically a computer, even though I had a base computer inside. Okay. And it grew and and uh, manifested itself into what later became the Series One, which was a similar type system, but all in the newer modern stuff that came along later and was developed and manufactured here in Boca Raton. Okay. So how did your responsibilities um, grow as, through your career? I mean, what projects did you work on after these initial systems when you came to Boca Raton? Well, about a year, somewhere like August of 1969, um, on a Sunday, I was playing softball in an IBM league, and I came home that afternoon after having a softball game, 
in finding out that one of the managers in our group who had come from Boca, his name was Bob McCormick, had gone to Pompano on a, a diving ship with a bunch of other IBM people, and I guess other than IBM, and went diving in the ocean. And long story short, he didn't come up. They ended up going down. He still had his weights on, <clears throat> and he died in Pompano uh, with his dive suit on. And so when I went to work the next day, we were, on Monday, we were minus a manager. And uh, I was basically a lead engineer in the group, but I wasn't a manager. Never thought I'd ever be a manager, but uh, Bill Murray was the lead manager in the area, and he called me in and he worked for John Rood, uh, Dr. John Rood, who also I had worked for in Endicott on the system 360 mod 30, and they offered me the job as a manager, in fact encouraged me after I said, gee, I don't think so, uh, to become a manager. So um, during the 360, I'm sorry, during the system 3 mod 6, I went from the group leader on the I.O. attachments to the manager of the I.O. attachments. And so from then on in Boca Raton, I was a manager. Uh, I became a manager. But uh, So I, I went from the, as I mentioned before, I went from the System 3 Mod 6 after we announced and shipped it. It was manufactured here in Boca onto ser uh, Series System 7 RPQs. And after System 7 RPQs, I transferred over to Series 1, uh, where, where I headed the development of the I.O. devices on uh, Series 1. We had keyboard printers and monitors, uh, video monitors and printers, uh, adapters, of which I managed that group. Um, after we got a lot of that stuff underway, that was called DPIO because the Series 1 at the time did not have any data processing I.O. gear on it, and that's what my group did. So after that, um, one of the managers was transferred over to back to Building 203 to start another project called a... Um, System 23 Data Master, and his name was uh, Bill Sidneys. Uh, and at the same time, a little later, well, uh, Bill Sidneys asked me to come over and be a manager on the system uh, on the System 23 Data Master. And my first job there was to look into. <clears throat> non-IBM technology to build this or develop this system. And so my group was looking into that while another manager, uh, uh, Gary Pitt, was looking at using IBM technology. Well, history will tell you that we, uh, thanks to a lead engineer called uh, Lou Egbrecht, who originally came from Rochester to uh, at Atlanta lab under John Rood, who had transferred it to uh, Atlanta, came, uh, Lou Egbrecht came to Boca Raton to work for me, and he was kind of the lead person on vendor technology. Um, and we ended up developing the System 23 Data Master with vendor technology to... Move, uh, I'll finish up on systems if that's what you want to no, do. Go, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so we'll come back to what I found, or what we found in Boca Raton when I first moved here, but I'll finish up on the systems and we'll come back. Okay. Um, so after the, uh, while the data master was in process, uh, Bill Sidney's, uh, 
who was my boss, uh, was pulled out and started another group in another area. And um, at the time he left, he was a second level manager. He left his second level manager job and I took that under Roger Abernathy who had moved over from series one to head up the System 23 Data Master. So Bill Sidney's moves out, starts this new group. I took his job as engineering manager of the System 23. So while we're finishing the System 23, Bill Sidney's is starting this group called the IBM that became the IBM Personal Computer. It had various nicknames of Peanut and Acorn, uh, and that was Bill Sidney's was the engineering manager of that. And there were uh, supposedly 12, uh, a dirty dozen who set that up when in fact I have uh, proof that there were 13, not 12. But anyway, I was not a member of that 12. But after I finished and we announced the System 23 Data Master, shortly after that, like about a month later, the PC, IBM Personal Computer, was announced. And it was decided that IBM needed a hard drive on the IBM PC. So, and at the same time, they needed a higher, faster technology. They needed two different needs to progress beyond the IBM PC. Because the IBM PC was more of a... Um, uh, 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 not, not a business system. It was more for uh, people that wanted to work on uh, development of their own little systems, but not a business system. So it was determined that IBM, in order to move forward, needed to make the PC into a business system. So one need was to add a hard drive. The other need was to add a higher faster technology with bigger and faster I.O. So the first thing they needed was a hard drive and that I was transferred into that group under Joe Sarubi to build the PCXT, which we put a hard drive on that and did a bunch of other things, but that was the primary need for it and got that out the door. That was my second, uh, I mean that was where I went after System 23. Now, at the same time, the higher speed and higher technology stuff uh, was also being developed, and that was called a PC-80. So, when I finished the PC-XT, we started, I, I, I started a group, a, a new group that was... Um, uh, oh man. Okay, go, going back to when I finished the PCXT, the same group that I had, we started another group, or we started another project, which ended up having the uh, designing the micro channel, which was a brand new thing that ends up later on in the uh, IBM. PS2. But meanwhile, I was pulled out of that group to go manage uh, the engine, become engineering manager of the PC Junior, which was having issues, uh, technical issues. So I managed the PC Junior, uh, took over as manager from another manager, and managed PC Junior till it was ready and in manufacturing before IBM decided not to proceed on that. Uh, after that, I went back to working on the uh, what IBM called the PS2 family, uh, where we focused on desktops, floor stands, laptops, and OS2 software. And that went on from 1985 to 1995, the PS2 development. And I was involved in that till I retired in 1993. Um, just a couple of points of interest during that period. 
1980, approximately 1987, the IBM employ, employment peaked here in Boca Raton with 11,000 employees about 1987. In 1988, Boca Manufacturing uh, moved to uh, uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, or Research Triangle Park in North Carolina, and that was about 1988. And then about 1996, the IBM System Development, uh, which moved to uh, Research Triangle Park in North Carolina, and that was the big building that I will mention here shortly, uh, where most of the people in that building left, and uh, left just a small building up in North Boca on the Delray border. Oh, well, it's uh, at, where from 1997 to 2013, the people there have focused on WebSphere software development and speech recognition. So that's kind of IBM system stuff. Mm -hmm. So what I thought I might do is digress back to what myself and my family found when we entered Boca Raton. Well, let's, okay. let's wait. Okay. Because okay. I have a couple other questions. Okay. All right. So um, can you talk about what the work culture or environment was while you were at IBM? Were they um, supportive? You know, describe how they were supportive or however you want to describe them. Probably the easiest way to, for me to describe this, I have to go back, I'll make this quick, but I spent 13 years in Endicott before coming here. And during the years in Endicott, IBM was making more money than they knew what to do with. Uh, most of their systems were um, leased. They, didn't, they weren't forced to sell them until the mid-60s. But in Endicott, we had... Um, we, we had all kinds of facilities for the uh, employees, families, swimming pools, golf courses, uh, Christmas parties, uh, whatever you could think of. Uh, IBM was a great family company and felt, uh, the employees felt the same as IBM. We, uh, it was a great feeling. So when I moved here to Boca, it was still pretty much the same thing, but IBM had come to the conclusion that when they were building all the new facilities, because IBM was expanding during the 60s uh, so greatly to Rochester, Minnesota, to Raleigh, North Carolina, and so forth and so on, uh, San Jose, and th they decided it was they couldn't afford uh, golf courses and uh, things like that for the employees, so things were tightening up in the profits were not so great, except the employees still loved IBM, if you will, and IBM seemed to have a great appreciation for family and employees. So during the early 60s, into the 70s, up into the early 80s, there wasn't much change. But coming to the late 70s and into the early 80s, we could feel a tightening. IBM was putting more pressure on how many employees they had, um, keeping track of your performance, um, less, con less employee-oriented feelings, and consequently the employees felt it and the feelings became relatively mutual. But right up until I retired in 1993, and up until today for me, IBM is still the greatest company in the world. And it, but I was there to witness it change. Any other, I, I think anybody during my period, and even now that would say IBM was, a, was and still is a great company. Okay. What would you say was one of your more interesting challenges while you were at IBM? I forget. 
That, well, I don't know. My challenges, my background was always in system development. And my challenges were always to get at the beginning when a product was being uh, described, documented, and put together and be involved in that and then put together a development plan, get the commitment from top management where the money would be, the development dollars would be put aside to pre prepare those systems. And then my challenge, primary challenge during my career was primarily to make it happen, if you will. We got to, we know what we're gonna do, we documented it, we promised, we put the dates together, we put the cost, estimated cost together, and now you gotta make it happen. And you gotta make it happen on a schedule because you have a window to get whatever you described out the door to make a profit for the time. So much of my challenges were working Many hours, I, in my entire, I'll, I'll speak of my entire career, including Endicott and Boca Raton, involved a six-day week for the, the number of 37 years I worked for IBM, I worked a six-day week, and I worked almost every evening till at least at least eight o'clock. And quite frankly, I always felt that was the way it was. That's the way we worked in Endicott. That's the way we worked here. We didn't, I, we never questioned it. It wasn't, um, we didn't see it as difficult. We didn't see it as being forced. We did it because we made a promise when we decided to put a product out and meet it, it was our commitment. And we did that, but that those were my challenges, especially here in Boca Raton. And to challenge the teams that I was involved in to do the same. Okay. What would you say is the impact on the IBM products on Boca Raton's history and Boca Raton on IBM's history? Probably the most significant thing, if you went around the world and asked questions to anybody or whatever, probably the IBM PC would come to mind only, be, only because it uh, was introduced to the average person, where most of IBM equipment prior to that, and even today, are behind walls cranking out business, um, the word IBM stands for International Business Machine, not personal computers. But to the average person working on the street, a personal computer means more to him than a big piece of iron sitting in uh, Armonk, New York, pumping out uh, big things for General Motors or some or Ford Motor Company or whatever. So um, that, if you're behind the scenes in IBM, you know how much other things other than the personal computer really mean as far as pers uh, personal or computer power. Um, but that's, that's the way it is with the average person. A PC has probably got the most. Okay. Now, you, you've touched lightly on um, the downsizing that occurred in the 90s. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Um, what was the environment like when the announcement came down? How did it affect you, your friends? Well, let's say the announcement of the transfer of the manufacturing, which was the first thing, um, 
it was it was not really stated, but it was inferred, at least we believed it was inferred, that only the manufacturing people were moving to Raleigh, North Carolina, or to the uh, our, uh, RTP, and that Boca would become or con continue and maybe even grow as a development community. And so, me being in the development community, uh, I I didn't like it because. I like to be very close to manufacturing, but quite frankly, um, at the time, or initially, I didn't think it was that big a deal for me personally or the groups that I worked with. But I knew the manufacturing people were devastated. Um, and quite frankly, I knew it was inevitable. Uh, you don't run an effective manufacturing facility with a development community 1,500 miles away or 1,200 miles away. It is not effective. And so we, at least I did, pretty much knew it was inevitable to happen. But now as you move along into the 1993 and 4 time frame when it was pretty obvious it was going to happen, it was understood why but not, not really um, making anyone happy. Uh, one has to remember when you're thinking about this, if you're manufacturing um, personal computers or any size of a computer, uh, most of your equipment that goes into your systems either comes from the Far East or comes from mid-America somewhere. So if you're going to manufacture it here, you got to bring it into the West Coast and ship it across the United States into Boca Raton, or you got to go into the into St. Louis or or Chicago and transfer it down here. Okay, so now you build the stuff, you test it, now you got to ship it back. So transportation on the books is big time. Plus, when you're going to pay people to live in a nice place like South Florida, you're probably going to have to pay a little bit more um, salary. And so it's, and you're going to be limited on how much space you got. You're going to be competing with people wanting to retire and buying land for that versus uh, North Carolina where they could expand their manufacturing facility and, and move together. So as much as it was not, didn't make anybody happy, it was under, relatively understood that this was all going to happen. Now, it's also understood, and I don't have all the details on this, but back during the 60s, I'm sorry, 70s, IBM was looking at expanding and was looking at going up north of of uh, University of Florida in buying land and moving manufacturing up there. And uh, there was a big tax issue that came up with the state of Florida, where the state of Florida says, you're not going to pay taxes on the products that you manufacture and ship out of Florida. You're also going to pay taxes on on items you manufacture elsewhere and ship worldwide. And that got to be a big issue with IBM. So in the background, my understanding is, I can't say I, I'm speaking for IBM, but IBM said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, we're thinking about moving to North Carolina anyway, so uh, if you're going to pull this tax deal on us, Florida, uh, we're going to wave goodbye. And that had a big bearing on the decision to move to North Carolina. Now, uh, there's more details on that, but I'm not going into it here. Okay, <laughs> no problem. All right, so if you wanted to back up now and go over what you found, what you have your notes on about what was here when you and your family arrived in Boca. Okay, when, when we arrived, again, I mentioned that almost everyone that was moving here, and I, I used the number uh, 200 earlier people, but 
that number was significantly less than that. It's probably even less than a hundred that came from Endicott and North in uh, San Jose. So everybody moving in here, there wasn't housing, so everybody was building houses, and so that was. Uh, and I, I did talk about building two hundred three and two ten. We all worked in those two buildings. Uh, the um, Again, I spoke about the System 3 and 7. Uh, just out of, of interest, the routes north and south uh, out of Boca Raton at the time, between Fort Lauderdale and West Palm Beach, there was US-1, there was Dixie, Military Trail, and the Florida Turnpike. There was no I-95 when we landed here. Shopping in Boca Raton. There was a Fifth Avenue shopping center, which had a Publix. There was a Camino shopping center, which had a Winn Dixie. There was a Royal Palm Plaza, or we used to call it the Pink Plaza. All of these places are still there, and that's the only places you could really buy groceries. There was a 7 Eleven here or there, but their prices, even though they're, they're, uh, Merchandise was good. It was kind of expensive, and uh, most people used either Winn Dixie or Publix. Uh, that was that uh, for food shopping. For other things, uh, the best you could do was Sears Town in downtown Fort Lauderdale, in the West Palm, the West Palm Beach Mall, uh, and you had to get there by military trail. And so each place to go shopping for clothing and things like that was about 25 miles in either direction closest. There was nothing in Boca Raton. In late 1969, the, the Pompano Fashion Square opened, and so people could go down to Pompano, and that was more like uh, 12 uh, or 15 miles away. Uh, the area roads in Boca Raton the east-west roads that went out as far as 441. You had to go south to Deerfield to take Hillsboro, or north to Atlantic to get in Del to get Atlantic and Delray, or the main one in Boca was Glades Road. There were the three that you could get out to 441, uh, or or get to the Turnpike, and only Glades got you to the Turnpike. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Hillsboro and Atlantic also got you to the, the turnpike. Uh, Glades going east, if you, uh, Glades started on 4th Avenue. E Glades did not go east of 4th Avenue at the time. Uh, military trail coming south died at Glades. There was, it did not go on through. It just died at a T. There was a gas station at the T at uh, where um, Glades Road hit Military Trail. Now, we're going to skip to Camino Real. Camino Real was paved, was a paved street or road that died um, I'm sorry, where was I at? Camino Real? Mm -hmm. Camino Real went uh, west from US-1 beyond the railroad tracks that are out beyond 15th Street. And it was paved to the, just on the other side of the tracks. And from the other side of the tracks, it was a dirt road. It went west about a few miles and then looped north and came to a T at Glades Road. So you can picture going out Camino Real, making a big loop and coming in, going north and coming in on Glades. Palmetto Park Road went west from US 1, past the same tracks as Camino Real, and was paved that far. It was a dirt road beyond the tracks 
out to where Camino was going north to Glades. So they met there. And that... Now, going back, where military came south to a T into Glades Road, if you came to that T and then went west, maybe 400 yards, you would come to where Camino Real and Palmetto Park Road, dirt road, came into Glades. So, if you lived on Palmetto, on, well, let's say you lived on Camino Real and you wanted to get out to the turnpike or you wanted to get on the military to go up to West Palm Beach, you would go out Camino Real, cross the tracks, hit the dirt road, loop north, come out on Glades. If you wanted to go to the turnpike, you would go left or west to the turnpike or come east about 400 yards at military to go up to West Palm Beach. That's the way Boca Raton was at the time. There's a little, what I call a hearsay, at the time we moved in, and maybe it was a joke, but we thought it was true, 25% of the residents of Boca Raton were millionaires. And back in 1967-68 time frame, um, to be a millionaire was something else. Today it's not that big a deal, I guess. But we heard that 25% were millionaires, and oh, by the way, once they heard IBM was coming, most of these millionaires were planning on moving somewhere else where they could put their place maybe in order. Okay, so just, just to go back a bit, the IBM <clears throat> presence in the South Florida area, actually my, own, my belief was approximately 1965. They were looking at building a facility here in Boca Raton later on, um, but um, just to, to make you know that IBM has a, probably still does, but had a criteria at the time. A site, in order to become a, a IBM location, the criteria was it had to have interstate transportation, meaning a U.S. highway, and rail within a piece of property within the, a reasonable distance of a piece of property IBM would buy. So if you're thinking of the IBM property in Boca Raton, these criteria were met. There was a U.S. highway, I-95 I was planned. It was not there, but it was planned. The railroad already was there. The university had to have a major university, and FAU met that requirement. Needed room for building expansion. The building had that. And it had to have a minimal to no union presence. IBM, non-union, did not build in Orlando, did not build in Tampa. And one of the reasons both locations were had a union presence. And that that's one of the major reasons. And then kind of below that, we IBMers at the bottom line believed that the IBM execs were looking for a retirement for themselves in mind. We do know that there were some IBM execs that had some um, condos and stuff already here in Boca back in the 65, 66 time frame. Uh, I know personally one of them, but that's here and there. But so that that didn't uh, did not uh, helped. I think anyway. So about 1966, there was really an IBM presence with personnel between 66 and 67. In fact, uh, I know that uh, in Fort Lauderdale, there was a group that became what's called, what later on became CDAB, which was a special engineering uh, group, uh, was in Fort Lauderdale. And then they had some people here shortly after 1967 here in Boca. So that kind of the genesis of Boca Raton. Okay, in, after that, uh, and IBM began the building uh, on Yamato Road, 
And in April 31st, 1970, the building on, Yuma, on 51st Street, Yamada Road, was dedicated. It was a big day. T.J. Watson, Jr., the chairman of IBM, the board, chairman of the board, IBM was here that day. Anita Bryant was the celebrity. The Florida State Lieutenant Governor Ray Osborne was here and a couple of pastors from town, Ray Osborne and Father Stephen Studmeyer was present and J.H. McCarthy was present in the background. A picture in the Boca Raton News, which I have with me in the background with all of those people stepping up onto the podium. Okay. Uh, when we got here, during, after we got here, there was significant Boca growth. Um, just a, another point of interest that just came to mind. I remember one Sunday afternoon riding my bicycle down to the, to um, Dixie Highway, uh, coming down Palmetto to Dixie Highway and US-1 going between the two. 